You want to see a card trick or something, like a magic trick? Every magic trick consists of three parts or acts. The first part is called the pledge. The magician shows you something ordinary. The second act is called the turn. The magician takes the ordinary something and makes it into something extraordinary. But you wouldn't clap yet because making something disappear isn't enough. You have to bring it back. In my previous video, I covered the first two episodes of the rehearsal. Check that out in the link below. In short, Nathan helped Kor confess his secret to a friend in the first episode, and in the second episode, he steps in to help Angela raise their rehearsal child, Adam, after her first choice flakes. Ended up totally my Scion TC at 100 miles an hour. Oh, wow. In this video, we're going to look at episodes three and four. In the third episode, Nathan continues to support Angela and Adam, roughing it on the farm for a few days. Soon, it's time to help a new client, Patrick. Patrick wishes to confront his brother about their grandfather's will. His brother is the executor of the estate. There is one stipulation before Patrick can receive any inheritance, that he cannot be in a relationship with a gold digger. A fake Raising Cane's chicken restaurant is built as the setting for the rehearsal. The Raising Cane restaurant is a real chain, but there is also a biblical allusion at play. Raising Cane is an old expression which means to behave angrily. In reference to the biblical Cain of Cain and Abel fame, Cain and Abel are two brothers, and Cain murders Abel because God likes him more. Huh. A sibling rivalry, you say? Despite Patrick's close relationship with his grandfather, I fucking changed his diapers, dude. You never changed a diaper. He hasn't received the inheritance he feels entitled to. Nathan learned something from Kor's rehearsal. Despite many trials, the real moment was driven forward by Kor's raw emotional response. Nathan believes that in order for Patrick to take the situation seriously, he must recreate the emotions he would feel during the discussion with his real brother. Nathan devises a preposterous plan to have Isaac, the actor who plays Patrick's fake brother, ask Patrick for help off the clock. Going to his family's farm, Patrick would meet another actor playing Isaac's real grandpa. So Patrick thinks all these interactions are out of character, away from the show. I've, I've got to say, Jesus, the grandpa actor is incredible. It's all this. They're filming me as a documentary. I'm not in a documentary. No, I know. They're, just, they're not filming you, Grandpa. They're just yeah. filming... The scene where he shits himself and Patrick's helps? Mm, chef's kiss. The Grandpa forms a bond with Patrick and promises him literal gold that they found on the property, only to die a few days later. It's so convoluted. It's so layered in its deception. And it's so funny. I was cackling as Nathan explained it all. Literal gold digging? After an emotional breakthrough during the rehearsal, Patrick never returns. Perhaps realizing it was a farce. Perhaps realizing he was now capable of doing it by himself. We are left with these threads dangling loosely in the wind. Nathan narrates, I was starting to wonder how I could so easily create feelings inside other people's rehearsals when I couldn't do it for myself. Throughout this episode, we see establishing shots of the farm. The seeds are planted by Nathan and Angela, but maintained by the show's staff. All the organic living off the land is for show. The food is store-bought. The real organic work is torn away and replaced overnight. Nathan robs himself of the experience of witnessing natural growth. To seed, to sprout, to flower, to fruit. With farming, there is no guarantee for success but the process is worthwhile because you grow too. Nathan is envious of others' ability to just immerse themselves in these fantasy worlds and just believe. The episode bookends itself. With the beginning of the episode, Angela is incredulous, thinking that Nathan is naive for not knowing Halloween as a satanic holiday. Nathan, where have you been all the time? Where have you been? I thought it was just trick-or-treating, really. I didn't think it was like there not, was a... Not everything is make-believe. The dramatic irony is that Angela seems to be content 
with this fantasy scenario Nathan has constructed. Angela's religious devotion is framed as another layer to buying into some idea, just because it's comforting. Angela and Nathan's realities are different. Nathan cannot fully deceive himself. As the episode concludes, Nathan ponders his place, the legitimacy of the life he's constructed. He flips a bell pepper around, showing its store-bought label, symbolizing the rejection of reality, a desire to keep pretending. Episode 4 is where we go off the rails. We're going full Charlie Kaufman, going full Andy Kaufman, full avant-garde postmodernism. Nathan leaves Oregon to return to LA. He realizes that some of the actors he has hired are not up to snuff. It's honestly a bit funny because his rehearsal actors are all slam dunks. He wants to teach his fielder method of acting, where his acting students observe a subject, soaking up every detail to then become someone else. Essentially stalking someone. While he says this class is to bring in more talent, I think Nathan is trying to learn to feel something himself by observing those who are experts at emoting. Due to his inexperience as an instructor, Nathan feels self-conscious about how his students perceive him, and he creates a rehearsal version of this class. He, as an actor, plays himself, and he plays one of the students, Thomas. Thomas is instructed to live the life of an acai bowl artisan, moving into a new apartment with new roommates to simulate his primary's home life. Becoming someone else and changing perspective allows Nathan a moment to analyze himself and the design of his class. Initially, when Nathan plays Thomas, he projects a lot of feelings that spins himself in a positive light. When I watched this scene with Thomas, I could sense his unease. But when Nathan speaks to fake Nathan during the same scene, he states that he feels special for getting one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher. Nathan is not feeling what Thomas feels, so he resets the class to the first day in order to channel some of the same feelings Thomas had. This is when Nathan decides to take things a step further and becomes Thomas outside of the acting class. With Thomas's apartment vacant, Nathan can now assume the role of Thomas completely. He becomes Thomas 24 seven, living Thomas's life. The narration Nathan has here is incredibly meta. He posits, why is this even being filmed? This isn't what the show is about. You get these camera cuts between Nathan's perspective looking at the camera and the camera's perspective looking at Nathan. And the audience is made aware of our culpability in all of this. This exists partially for us. A poor performance could ruin someone's life, but they perform for our entertainment. It's almost like the joke is on the audience this time. Nathan, as Thomas, thinks about how he wanted to ask questions, but didn't want to stand out. Now this moment reminds me of Thomas's nervous laughter and the apprehension towards the fielder method. When cameras are on you, you do what you think they want you to do. Then you do what other people are doing, because that's what humans do. The nail that stands up gets hammered down. Undeniably, there's a power play at hand. This could be your big break after all. This Ouroboros of impersonation feels deeply uncomfortable and invasive. What is really the point of all of this? Nathan states that no matter how far down the rabbit hole he travels, part of Thomas's life is still a mystery. You can never truly understand someone by imitation. Every moment in one's life shapes them in some small way, like rivers eroding the land, shaping the grand canyons of complexity. Over the course of time, we are shaped into something beautiful. <laughs> Holy crap, this girl is just Meg Griffin. Nathan returns to Oregon a few weeks later. He is greeted by Adam, who is now 15. Nine years have gone by. Adam is now a sweet and awkward teen. He gives his old dad a hug. However, Nathan seems regretful that he missed so much of Adam's life. He desires a true emotional return. Throughout the episode, we learn that Angela has a lot of resentment towards her father, for being absent, and that is what turned her to drug use at a young age. Nathan strangely recreates this with Adam's actor, Joshua. Nathan instructs Joshua to recreate his homecoming with a more realistic approach. Look who decided to show up. This time, 
Adam is resentful towards Nathan. There's a sequence of Nathan coaching Joshua on what to do, and then cutting to him acting out what he just taught. All of this feels so inorganic. And at this moment, I'm thinking, why is Angela even here? This doesn't serve her ability to parent at all. It just It's just a worst-case scenario for him as part of his own rehearsal. I don't really think it's to teach Angela a lesson, even though it's obviously taking direct inspiration from her upbringing. To Angela's credit, she does take this pretty seriously, but by this point, the camera has abandoned Angela's perspective almost entirely. You're a fucking disaster, my guy. Nathan asks if Angela would like a redo and have Adam go back to age six. It feels very self-serving in this instance. He wants to go back because he didn't get the experience with Adam that he wanted. Is Adam's slide into destructive behavior just an excuse for Nathan to get what he wants? When Angela agrees, camera does this very strange perspective flip in the hallway, almost to convey the turn back of the clock. Adam ODs. This is the funniest thing in the show. I need to point out that the paramedics are some of the students from his acting class. So much focus was put on them at the beginning of this episode, and now they are just extras in the scene. The episode concludes with some narration by Nathan as teenage Adam goes down the slide at a playground and transforms back into the six-year-old version of himself. It's easy to assume that others think the worst of you, but when you assume what others think, maybe all you're doing is turning them into a character that only exists in your mind. And the nice thing is that sometimes all it takes is a change in perspective to make the world feel brand new. This quote is beautiful, but within the context of this episode, it's also a little eerie. It exemplifies what makes this show so interesting. We make judgments about others, and in our head we create a version of others that is one-dimensional. Or if we're lucky enough to get closer to someone, two-dimensional. We never really know what it's like to exist as another person. It's impossible to actually become someone else, but it's incredibly easy to create an impression of what someone is in your own mind one shaded by your own biased perceptions. How many times have you personally thought about someone who confronted you earlier in the day, and in your mind you act out some sort of sick clapback just in case it happened again? The second part of this quote feels strange, because a perspective change can be useful to empathize with others or to re-examine oneself. The ability to redo life is something Nathan exploits throughout this episode. He does it with his acting class, he does it when he meets the 15-year-old Adam, and he does it when Adam reverts back to a small child. As the architect for the show, Nathan doesn't seem to be learning the right lesson from the change of perspective. He doesn't live with the consequences of his actions, or really improve himself in any way. Instead, his perspective change is external. He changes the world to suit him. For years, I've felt this strange anxiety that, as an adult, I should be further along. But I'm afraid of change. I don't want to miss out on the way things are now, or the way they could be in the future, and I'm pulled in both directions. It seems like a generational ennui. Millennials are not settling down like previous generations have before. We are breaking a cycle, for better or for worse. To explore the unknown, to trail off of the path paved before you, is really frightening when it's not what others expect. Thank you all for watching. Uh, please leave a comment below of maybe some of your favorite moments from the show. Please tune in again if you like this video. Um, I plan to do another video on episode 5, Apocalypto. Thank you all for watching. Bye-bye.